בראשית הרע אלוהים את השמיים ואת הארץ. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. In six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. From the San Diego, California headquarters of the Institute for Creation Research, here are ICR scientists and Back to Genesis lecturers, Dr. John D. Morris and Ken Ham. I'm convinced that Noah's flood is really the bottom line issue in resolving this creation evolution controversy. John Dr. Morris recognized the importance of the flood too, and he wrote the classic book, The Genesis Flood, some 30 years ago, back in 1960. Actually, this is the book that really started the modern creationist movement. In this book, he pointed out the implications of the flood and answered many of the questions people have concerning the biblical record of that event. That's right. You know, if you were to ask an evolutionist, where's the evidence for evolution? Where's the evidence that the earth is millions or billions of years old? The answer will invariably be in the rocks and fossils. But if Noah's flood really happened, it would have laid down the rocks and fossils, and then the rocks and fossils would be evidence for Noah's flood and not evidence for evolution or an old earth. It's sad that many Christians try to incorporate evolution into their worldview and reject the idea of a global flood. In this program, Dr. Morris is going to give us both the scientific and scriptural evidences for the global flood and the catastrophic nature of the geological record. Let's watch. At this time, we're going to be speaking on the theme of the Genesis flood. I'm sure you're very familiar with the biblical story of the flood, but maybe you didn't know, or maybe you did know, that this is one of the events in the Bible which is under the greatest attack by those who don't believe the Bible. The flood is considered to be uh, tradition or myth, anything but fact, and particularly in the world of geology, the science which deals with the history of the world, they say there was no such thing as a worldwide flood such as the Bible describes. Well, we maintain, of course, that the biblical story of the flood is absolutely true and that all of the real facts of science support it. I want to begin by reading a chapter, not a chapter, but a couple of verses of Scripture in the last chapter that the Apostle Peter wrote before he died. And he was looking forward to the last days. I believe we're in the last days. If not, we're certainly closer to them than anyone's ever been before. And this, therefore, would have more relevance to us than to anybody before us. And here's what he says. In, in the last days there shall come scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. That is, people will be saying, we don't believe in the great promises of God's purpose for the world. He's coming someday to accomplish all of his purposes, to restore all the good things that he had in the beginning. We don't believe that because since the fathers fell asleep, that is, they died, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. The reason why people are able to reject the promises of God for the future is because they don't believe the record of what had, took place in the past. They say all things continue as they were, not just from the end of the creation, but from the beginning of the creation. So therefore, we can explain everything in the world today, everything that is existing today, everything that has existed in terms of natural processes, which we study in science, that have been going on just as they are now since the very beginning of time, the very beginning of the creation. And this is nothing but the philosophy of evolution, which says that we can explain all things in terms of processes that continue today. So this is a prediction 2,000 years ago of the dominance of the belief in evolution in the last days. That's, of course, being fulfilled today. But then the Apostle Peter goes on to say, for this they willingly are ignorant of. They ought to know better. The evidence is all against them. They willingly ignore the evidence. First, that the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water by the word of God. That is, God created the heavens and the earth by his own word. And then secondly, the world that then was, literally the whole cosmos that then was, the heavens and the earth that existed then, being overflown or literally cataclysmically overwhelmed with water, perished. So the first cosmos, the heavens and the earth which were in the beginning, that God created in the beginning, those were destroyed in the great flood. And so he says if we recognize the tremendous evidence for creation and the flood, that we'll be able to have a full answer to the philosophy of evolution which will dominate the world in the last days. I remember when I was just a young Christian, I began to study the Bible, and I was beginning to 
try to find answers to evolution, which I believed at that time as a college student. And I found that, uh, that this record of the Apostle Peter concerning the importance of the story of the flood in the last days as the real answer to evolution was the key to the understanding of Earth history. And so I began to study geology. In fact, I went off to graduate school then to get my major in hydraulics, the study of water, and geology as my minor, the study of the Earth, because I could see that the story of the flood was the real key to the understanding of Earth history. Uh, the book, The Genesis Flood, which was uh, co-authored by John Whitcomb of Grace Seminary and myself back in 1961, uh, the Lord used graciously to provide the sort of catalyst to develop the modern creationist movement, because other people also could then begin to see the tremendous importance of the Great Flood. So even though many people today reject the story of the flood and they've considered it simply a fable or a tradition, the fact is that it provides the real answer to the study of Earth history. So that's what I'd like to discuss today. Now, because the world of scholarship and science, for the most part, rejects the idea of the flood, many Christians have become intimidated by this and have tried to compromise on this issue. They've said, well, the story of the flood has to be reinterpreted. For example, they say that either the flood was just a, a local flood, it was not a worldwide flood, or if it did cover the world, it just rose up so quietly and went down so softly that it left no record. But neither of those theories will hold at all. The, sto the, the story of the Bible is very plain in teaching a worldwide cataclysmic destructive deluge in the days of Noah. As far as the idea of a local flood is concerned, uh, I don't know how any Christian who believes the Bible could read a local flood into the story of the, of the Scriptures. All you have to do is read the 6th, 7th, 8th, and ninth chapters of Genesis, and you'll see that it's clearly talking about a worldwide, world-destroying flood. For example, it says that the waters went up for five months and covered all the mountains, every high hill under the whole heaven, every mountain was covered with water. And then it says they began to go down, and finally on the, at the end of the 150 days, the five-month period, the ark rested on the mountains of Ararat, where there have been many reports that people have come back with from time to time that they have seen the remains of the ark still on Mount Ararat. At any rate, it rested on Mount Ararat probably because it's the highest mountain in the whole region. And it then says, after it rested on the 150th day, that then it was another two and a half months before they could even see the tops of the other mountains. So evidently it was on the highest mountain, and then it was a whole year before they could come out of the ark. And Mount Ararat today is 17,000 feet high. Now, a local flood, you simply cannot have a 17,000 foot high year-long local flood. Hydraulically, that simply is impossible. It wouldn't be. And then, of course, there are other reasons. The uh, story says that God promised he would never send this flood again to Noah. And if it was only a local flood, he didn't keep his promise because there have been devastating local floods all over the world all, all the time since. And so it wasn't a local flood. In fact, in one of my books, the Genesis record, the commentary on Genesis, there's an appendix giving a hundred reasons, both biblical and geological reasons, why the flood was worldwide. So we have to recognize that the Bible is talking about a worldwide flood, and as far as the idea of a, of a tranquil, non-destructive worldwide flood is concerned, uh, a tranquil flood, that's even more impossible. You know from your own experience, maybe you've been in floods, at least you've read about them, you know that even small local floods today can do, do tremendous amount of damage and can do a great amount of erosion and great amount of geological deposition. And then to say that a worldwide flood wouldn't leave any record, it's simply absurd. A, a worldwide tranquil flood is about like a worldwide tranquil explosion. It's simply impossible. You can't have any such thing. So we have to recognize that the Bible does teach plainly that there was a worldwide, world-destroying flood in the days of Noah. People have said, for example, that the ark that Noah built couldn't possibly hold two of every species of animal. And they build up big stories about how there are millions upon millions of different species of animals. And the Bible says that Noah took two of every kind of animal into the ark, and so it's impossible. And even the popular children's books that you have, they show a little, kind of a little boat with a few animals going into it, and they think it's just a sort of a children's story that couldn't possibly be really true. But the fact is that the ark was a tremendous structure. The dimensions are given in the Bible in terms of cubits. Now, nobody knows exactly what a cubit was. Most of them, most people think it was probably about 18 inches. But the smallest number that I've ever seen quoted for the cubit was 17 and a half inches. And if you assume that that's what it was, which is the smallest that anybody's ever suggested, then the dimensions turn out to be uh, still very large, as you see on the picture, uh, still very 
uh, substantial, uh, still very uh, substantial structure, almost as big as the greatest ocean-going vessels today. And you can calculate, uh, if you want to, the, the ark is described in the Bible as having three stories to it with uh, cells or nests or cages for the animals. And then you have to ask, well, how many animals were in the ark? We don't know exactly, of course, because we don't know how many different kinds of animals there were in the original creation. But we do know this, that, that uh, Noah did not have to take the fishes on the ark or the other marine animals or the insects, the animals like that, that uh, occupy the greatest number of species. So if you take the land animals, the birds and the mammals and the reptiles and amphibians, the ones that might have to be on the ark, and take two of every known kind or known species of those, there's 17,000, 18,000 species of living animals like that, and then you double that for two of each kind of animal, and then you maybe double that again for the extinct animals like dinosaurs and other animals that don't exist today, and of course there are not near as many extinct animals known as there are living animals. So uh, at the very most, uh, you would only have to have uh, about that many animals, uh, say 18,000 times maybe four, 72,000 some, some odd animals. How many animals could the ark hold? Well, the capacity of the ark was the equivalent of 522 standard railroad stock cars, which carry animals. And it's known that each one of those could carry 240 sheep. So if you multiply 240 by 522, you get 125,000 or so sheep-sized animals that could be on the ark. And the ark only had to have about 70,000 animals at the very most. And of course, a sheep is a large animal. There are a few big animals like elephants and dinosaurs maybe, but, only, but most animals are small like rabbits and mice. And so if you say the average size was a sheep, we're being very generous. And consequently, we come to the conclusion that the ark was big enough to hold two of every species of land animal, living or extinct, that we know anything about, and about half of its capacity. That means there's plenty of room on the ark for animals, for food for the animals, for water for the animals, for Noah and his family to play shuffleboard, whatever they want to do while they were in the ark for a year. And the whole story, you see, becomes silly if it's only a local flood. Didn't have to have an ark that big to preserve life through a local flood. In fact, you don't have to have an ark at all because in the year that it took, or the 120 years actually, that it took Noah to build the ark, he and his family could have moved out to Costa Mesa or somewhere, and the birds could have, they fly thousands of miles to get away from bad weather, and animals migrate, so there wouldn't have been any need for an ark at all if it was a local flood. So the Bible is very plain. It was a worldwide flood, and the Bible indicates that the ark was plenty big to hold two of every land animal that we know anything about. Now another question that people have raised about the ark is if it was such a violent flood as we're talking about, wouldn't it have just completely been capsized by the great waves that a worldwide flood would produce? No, it wouldn't. As a matter of fact, the dimensions of the ark are so carefully chosen by God, he was the one who designed it for Noah, told him how to make it, how long and wide and how to make it, that uh, it was just ideally designed to be stable in the water. I didn't have to swim fast through the water. That wouldn't have the purpose of it, the purpose was simply to be stable. And the dimensions of the ark were so carefully designed that it was practically impossible to capsize. Uh, the sketch shows that if the ark was tilted over by a wave to where it was uh, at a big angle of tilt, even almost as much as 90 degrees, that the uh, weight of the ark, which would go down through its center of gravity, was always inside of the buoyant force, which is outside, and would tend to bring it back up again. So always there's going to be a writing moment, as it's called, to bring the ark back into a stable position. Now, some people doubted that when we told them that a number of years ago. They were making a film on the story of Noah's ark. And so they had a, one of the prominent hydraulic laboratories with a big wave tank in their laboratory to make a model of the ark and test it to see. And sure enough, they found that there was no way they could generate waves violent enough and big enough to capsize the ark. So it, uh, it was stable. It served the purpose that God intended for it. Matter of fact, there are other evidences besides the story in the Bible. Did you know that instead of just being a, one Bible story and maybe one or two other stories somewhere, there are over 200 different flood traditions around the world. Practically every uh, South American, North American tribe, practically every ancient nation, practically every South Pacific tribe, the American Indians, the African tribes, all of them have a story of the ark and of the flood, or most of them do. And furthermore, they're very similar in many cases to the biblical story.
Now, they all d diverge from it somewhat, and they're all obviously uh, mythological in a sense, but it's obvious that they're all based on an, an original fact, and the real story is given to us in the Bible. So the biblical record of the flood is supported by the recollections of primitive nations all over the world. Another interesting thing is that the, uh, that the, that the Lord caused the ark to finally rest on Mount Ararat, or at least in that vicinity somewhere, and that was an ideal place for the family of Noah and for the animals in the ark to go out and repopulate the world because it was the, at the center of the earth's land masses. We uh, had a computer study made in, in our, with some of the people in our company, our, our organization some time ago, and they made a computerized study summarizing the total distances to all land segments uh, around the world from every possible point in the world. And they found that the one which would give the minimum total distance to all the other parts of the world was a location in Turkey somewhere, probably near the present city of Ankara, but rather close to Mount Ararat, also close to Babel and to Jerusalem. In other words, the center of focus of interest in biblical history and of the, the development of mankind and the radial migrations of mankind from the ark and then later from Babel were expedited by the location at which God caused the ark to to locate when it rested finally on the Mount of Ararat instead of in South America or, or somewhere else. Well, so the story of the ark and the story of the flood and the story of Noah and his family uh, makes good sense. You can show that the calculation of the developing population of the world makes good sense if we start with Noah and his family, whereas if you start a million years ago, it makes no sense at all. There would be far too many people in the world today if uh, man is much older than the few thousand years of the biblical history from the time of the flood. But the real problems, of course, that are encountered in connection with uh, the Genesis flood are the scientific or the geological problems because our modern geological world says that there was no such thing as a worldwide flood. And they have developed the, the uh, idea of long geological ages, totaling about 4.6 billion years of history with different ages and different forms of life in the different ages, as read through the rocks of the earth and the fossils that are found in them. They have developed this into what's known as the geological time scale, or the geological column. And the idea of the geological column, or the geological time scale, is that the geological ages are recorded for us in the sedimentary rocks in the crust of the earth. And the idea is that as you go down deep into the rocks of the earth, you'll find simple forms of life that were living in very ancient times. And as you come up towards more recent rocks, you'll find uh, more complex forms of life and find the human life at the very top. And so the thought is that as the different sediments were deposited and were preserving the forms of life that lived in the different ages, building up from the bottom to the top, that we have an actual record of the evolution of life over long geological ages. Now that idea was developed especially in the early 19th century by a number of geologists, particularly by Sir Charles Lyell and James Hutton and a number of others. But the original geologists, the ones who first studied geology and first tried to organize the history of the Earth, they all believed that all of these fossils and the sedimentary beds had been formed by the Great Flood. As a matter of fact, uh, the uh, idea of uniformitarianism and evolutionism, that all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation, uh, was uh, never proved, and the idea of the uh, worldwide flood and creation was never disproved. It was just that people preferred to believe that way. And we believe that the actual evidence uh, really supports the original geologists who did believe the biblical record of the story of the flood and interpreted their geological history that way. And that's what the Apostle Peter suggests, that the evidence is so strong that those who reject it are willfully ignorant. And they do not want to believe in creation and the flood, and so therefore they believe in naturalism and uniformitarianism and evolutionism. And then other people followed their lead, and now we have the dominance of humanism in our world today as a result. Well, what about the actual geological evidence? What does it really show in terms of the history of the, of the Earth? Now, as you can see from the, the geological column, Back in the Cambrian period, there was supposed to be only simple marine invertebrate organisms, like sponges and starfish and brachiopods and so on. Then as you go up towards more recent time, you get to where there were fishes, and then higher up than that, amphibians, then above that, reptiles, and finally birds and mammals, and eventually man. 
But the significant point is that in all that record, there are no evidence eventually man. But the significant point is that in all that record, there are no evolutionary transitional forms. And Dr. Gish has shown that compellingly in his book, Evolution, the Challenge of the Fossil Record, and also in his video on the same subject. And we are not going to discuss that very much here, but just to point out the fact that there are no evidences of evolution in all these billions of fossils that have been found in the geological record. Let me just give one quotation that kind of confirms that. Dr. David Kitts, professor of geology at the University of Oklahoma, is a man with whom Dr. Gish and I had a debate several years ago on the subject of creation versus evolution. So he was an evolutionist. But in the journal Evolution, which was an article which was actually written after our debate, he says this. He says, despite the bright promise that paleontology, a paleontology is simply the study of fossils, despite the bright promise that paleontology provides a means of our seeing evolution, it has presented some nasty difficulties for evolutionists, the most notorious of which is the presence of gaps in the fossil record. Evolution requires intermediate forms between species. Paleontology does not provide them. Darwin was concerned enough about this problem to devote a whole chapter of his Origin of Species to this. And he says that the imperfection of the geological record, the gaps in the fossil record, is because they don't have enough fossils. But here now, 125 or more years after Darwin, literally billions of fossils have been documented. And even today, there are no intermediate transitional forms between basic kinds of life in the fossils that have ever been documented. So if evolution took place, it did so without leaving any evidence of it. Now, there are some extinct animals, like dinosaurs maybe, and other kinds of animals that are extinct. But extinction isn't evolution. That's the opposite of evolution. That's things going out of existence, not coming into existence and building up into higher levels of existence. And the fossil record shows no evidence of evolution, whatever. Now, some people would take exception to that. And they'd say, yes, there are transitional forms in the fossils. And so we ask them what? And almost invariably, they will refer to a creature called Archaeopteryx. Archaeopteryx is a fossil bird. About, well, there are two good fossils that have been found and about four others that are not so good. But this is supposed to have, have, have uh, characteristics of both birds and reptiles. And so they say this proves that birds evolved from reptiles. But the fact is that it's a true bird. It had wings. It had feathers, beautifully aerodynamically designed feathers was a true bird, and its uh, characteristics that uh, slightly reptilian, like uh, teeth and claws, uh, really don't prove anything at all, except that it was an extinct bird that had teeth. Now, it was at the very most not a transitional form, but a mosaic form. Let me make a, uh, give a, a statement from Dr. Stephen Jay Gould and Niles Eldridge. These are the most prominent art evolutionists today in terms of the study of evolutionary, the evolutionary mechanism that they call punctuated equilibrium. And they, what they've done, you see, is to try to explain why there are no transitional forms in the fossil record by saying that evolution took place suddenly, what they call punctuations in the normal equilibrium or stasis position of fossils. They would say that ordinarily a particular species may exist for 100,000 generations without any change, and all of a sudden a small group will change very rapidly without leaving any record of the change, and then it'll settle down for another 100,000 generations. But these punctuations in the equilibrium, they consider to be the explanation for evolution. Of course, there's no evidence of that. They're arguing not from any evidence, but from lack of evidence. Anyway, with respect to uh, Archaeopteryx, let me read you what these two very strong evolutionists say. They say, at the higher level of evolutionary transition between basic morphological designs, gradualism has always been in trouble, even though it remains the official doctrine of most Western evolutionists. And then they say, smooth intermediates between ball plana, that is, basic structural plans, are almost impossible to construct even in thought experiments. There's certainly no evidence for them in the fossil record. And then in parentheses, they say, curious mosaics like Archaeopteryx do not count. So they recognize that, most, that Archaeopteryx is not a transitional form, but a mosaic form, by which they mean it has features of both birds and reptiles. It's a mosaic. But the features are fully functional and fully developed. They're not transitional features. You see, in order to change from a reptile to a bird, this animal has got to go through a lot of very significant changes. Obviously, its legs have to evolve into wings. And its scales have to evolve into feathers. So somewhere, there ought to be intermediate animals with half scales and half feathers, or skethers, and half legs and half wings, or lings, or something like that. And the reptilian heart has to become like that of a bird, and so on. So there are a lot of intermediate changes that have to take place.
and none of these intermediate changes have ever been found. So uh, he says here, and I thought this was interesting, he says that, that it's impossible to construct these intermediates even in thought experiments. If you try to think what kind of a creature would be intermediate between a lizard and a bird of some kind in the process of evolving, you'll have to see that it wouldn't work. We ask our artists to kind of imagine what it might be like. And so he came up with this creature, which he says is the lizard evolving into a bird. Now, maybe it wasn't like that, but uh, if you can think of a better way of representing it, somehow it had to change. So here you see the scales are trying to become feathers, and the leg is trying to become a wing. And this little uh, reptilian bird-like thing is about to evolve into a bird. Oh, it's not either, because you see, the lizard family out of which this is evolving isn't going to like this sport here. And uh, it's not going to put up with him, and they're going to try to destroy him. And since he can't fly yet, he can't get away, he can't run anymore because the, <laughs> the, the wings are holding him down. And so he's not able to defend himself. And what's going to happen is he'll become extinct like that. And so he never would evolve into a bird at all. And the same thing is true with every other imaginary intermediate form. There is no evidence at all for evolution in the fossil record. Well, then the question would be, what is the fossil record telling us then? If it isn't teaching evolution, what is it telling us? What about all these long geological ages, 4.6 billion years of Earth history divided up into the various periods, the Cambrian and the Ordovician and the Silurian and Devonian, all these different periods, each of them hundreds of millions of years long with the different forms of life in them. If that's not evolution, what is it? Well, we think it's a flood, but let me uh, first back up and, and ask how they know that these different ages existed. Nobody was there then to see and record what happened. How do they know that these different ages existed at all? Now, the idea is, of course, that the, over the ages that uh, sediments were eroded from the continents and transported to the ocean and deposited on the continental shelf or the floodplain or somewhere. And in the process of transportation, uh, animals might get caught up in the sediments and be transported and finally buried with the sediments. And then after a long period of time, they would become fossilized. And the sediments would turn into rock. You'd have the sediment becoming a, a sandstone or a shale or a limestone or some other sedimentary rock. And the fossil remains would be preserved there. And uh, so now we find the forms of life that lived in that former age. And of course, the deeper down the sediments are, the idea is that the older the rocks are and the older the forms of life are. But now the problem is with that, Supposedly, in the geological column, the oldest ones ought to be on the bottom. But there are lots and lots of places, like shown on the chart here, where there are old formations on top of young formations. And so you can't go by the order of deposition. Now, let me read a statement from a standard textbook in geology by von Ingel and Castor. And they're talking about the geological column and how that got to be that way, where, we, where it came from. In other words, you don't find this out in the field anywhere. You can go to the Grand Canyon or any other place where there are a lot of geological formations exposed, and you'll never find that geological column. The only place you'll ever find it is in the textbook. It doesn't exist in the real world at all. It's an artificial construct that's been built up by various devices. And let me read what those devices were. These authors say, if a pile were to be made by using the greatest thicknesses of the sedimentary beds at each geological age, it would be at least 100 miles high. And so the geological column or the geological time table represents 100 miles at least of sedimentary thickness of rocks. Uh, some authors would say up to 200 miles, but at least 100 miles. Whereas the greatest known geological column in the world is only about 15 to 20 miles, some maybe in the Gulf Coast region. And many places there's nothing at all there. The crystalline bottom rocks are right on the surface, like up in the Canadian Shield. And the average around the world for the geological column is one mile. So where do you get the 100 miles? Well, he goes on to say, it's of course impossible to have even a considerable fraction of this at one place. But by application of the principle of superposition, lithologic identification, recognition of unconformities, and reference to fossil successions, both the thick and the thin masses are correlated with other beds at other sites. Thus, there is established in detail a stratigraphic succession for all the geological ages. So that's the way it was done. Now, pardon me for having to use geological terms here. And I know this may not be familiar to many people unless they've taken a course in geology. But it, it is important to try to understand where they got this, because this is the main bulwark of the theory of evolution, this geological record with the fossil record. They say they did it by superposition, lithologic identification, recognition of unconformities, 
in reference to fossil successions, those four devices. Well, as far as superposition is concerned, as you can see, there are lots of places where there are old rocks on top of young rocks, so it isn't necessarily true that the oldest rocks are on the bottom. So that isn't necessarily the way to do it. And if you question that, let me read a statement from an article by Dr. B.F. Ryan, who says, in many places, the oceanic sediments of which the mountains are composed are inverted with older sediments lying on top of the younger ones. He says that's true in many places. Now that applies to whole formations whole ages are inverted, but it also applies to individual fossils where fossils from different ages occur together. And there might be an individual fossil or a few fossils that uh, are old that are above some that are young. This is a very recent article by Dr. Cutler and Dr. Plessa of the Department of Geoscience University of Arizona, and this was published just uh, this past June, so it's very recent. And the title of the article is Fossils Out of Sequence. And they say this, any sequence in which an older fossil occurs above a younger one is stratigraphically disordered. Scales of stratigraphic disorder may be from millimeters to many meters. Stratigraphic disorder is produced by the physical or biogenic mixing of fossiliferous sediments and the reworking of older previously described hard parts into younger sediments. Well, that's a way that maybe they can explain it, that they're out of order. But they do say, since these processes occur to an extent in virtually all sedimentary systems, stratigraphic disorder at some scale is probably a common feature of the fossil record. So it simply is not true that you find them in the same order all over the world. And then down here a little further, they say, the widespread occurrence of these anomalies in dated sections suggests that disorder should be taken seriously by paleobiologists and stratigraphers working at these stratigraphic scales. Well, you can't depend on superposition, then, as a means of determining the age of a rock and where it ought to fit into the geological column. How about the next one, the lithologic identification? Now, that term, lithology, has to do with the type of rock. So the idea would be that maybe granites occur in one geological age, uh, shales in another age, limestones in another age, and so on. And early geologists, some of them did believe that. But they don't believe that anymore because they now know that rocks of every type occur in every geological age. You can find granites and uh, basalts and metamorphic rocks and limestones and shales, rocks of every type in every age. And furthermore, the minerals in the rocks you can find in every age. And the different types of structures in the, like the great faults and folds and so forth occur in every age. And even coal and oil occur in rocks of just about every age. And so the type of the rock or the contents of the rock don't tell you anything about the age of the rock. Some might say, well, what about uranium lead systems, radiogenic minerals in rocks. Don't they tell you the age of the rocks? No, because these radiogenic minerals, not usually used to get the age of a sedimentary rock anyway, but only igneous rocks, which is a different subject altogether. But at any rate, all of these ages had been determined long before anybody ever discovered radioactive dating. And so the ages don't depend on radioactive dating at all. And even now, if a radioactive date disagrees with the geological age, It'll be the radioactive age that will be discarded because there are many things that can go wrong with that. I do plan to talk about that in another occasion on the age of the Earth, but just to note that in passing, that there's nothing about the contents of the rock, even radiogenic minerals, that will tell you the age of a rock. Superposition doesn't tell you the type of the rock, the contents of the rock don't tell you the age. Now, what about the next one, which is unconformities? Now, I need to define that term. An unconformity is an interface between two formations in which the one above does not conform to that one below. And by conformity, I mean the slope of the strata, or the layers. Now, you've all seen, I'm sure, in highway cuts or in canyon sections, these layered rocks. And you know that sometimes the layers are at some kind of an angle, sometimes they're horizontal. And what, they, what each one of these layers or strata represents is a sedimentary phenomenon. Sediment is being transported by water and then deposited, and then the velocity changes or some other hydraulic factor changes, and so there's another stratum formed, and then another. And as long as the deposition process is going on continuously, well, the strata will all be parallel and continuous. But if you come to a place where they are not continuous, where there's an unconformity, the ones below do not conform to those above. For example, as in the sketch there, you may have tilted strata, and then above that, horizontal strata. Well, the interface between these two formations is an unconformity. And that's supposed to represent a gap in time. The deposition process is going on continuously as long as the strata are parallel, 
But now, all of a sudden, we have an erosion period where the deposition process stops and erosion takes place. Probably the particular formation is elevated up above the water surface. In the process, maybe it's tilted. And then erosion begins to take place before finally the water surface rises again and deposition begins to take place once more. Well, that unconformity then represents a gap in time. And so the idea would be that that unconformity surface will represent a time surface and everything below that is one age and everything above that is a later age. No, that doesn't work either, as the sketch indicates. So Cronus horizon does not conform to the unconformity surface. Now, again, I have to apologize for using geological terms. Isochronus is a Greek, comes from Greek words meaning equal time. And so an isochronous surface is one on which every point does have the same age. It's an isochronous surface, equal time surface. But you see, that cuts across the unconformity surface. This author in the Geological Society Bulletin, Dr. Chang, says many unconformity bounded units are considered to be chronostratigraphic units in spite of the fact that unconformity surfaces inevitably cut across isochronous horizons. Hence, they can't be true chronostratigraphic boundaries. So you can't tell the age of a rock by the unconformity surfaces because these unconformity surfaces may cut across rocks of different ages. Well, how do you do it then? Well, remember there was one other, and that's the reference to fossil successions. And that's really the way. And let me read a statement from Dr. Hollis Hedberg. When he wrote this, he was president of the Geological Society of America, certainly one of the top geologists of the world. He died just very recently. Great man of the field of geology. And he said this, fossils have furnished through their record of the evolution of life on this planet an amazingly effective key to the relative positioning of strata in widely separated regions and from continent to continent. Now you see, he says fossils provide the key to the relative positioning of the strata, which one's old, which one's young. Fossils do that? How do fossils do that? He says through their record of the evolution of life on this planet, that's how they do that. The idea is, therefore, that if you find fossils in a rock that represent a certain stage of evolution, that will date the rock. If you find fossils representing another stage of evolution, that will date the rock at some different age. The rocks are dated by the age of the fossils based on evolution. That's what he says. Now, that would be okay if we knew that evolution were true, if we had some sort of a divine revelation that evolution were true. Sure, it would take place all over the world the same way, so that if you had rocks representing a certain, fossil representing a certain stage of evolution, that would be the best way to date those rocks, if we knew evolution were true. But how do we know evolution is true? Well, remember that the best way to prove evolution is by the fossil record. And how do fossils prove evolution? Well, because in old rocks you find simple fossils representing long time ago, in young rocks, you find complex fossil representing recent age. And so you have the sequence from old to young preserved in the, in the rocks by the fossils. Well, I guess that would be all right if we knew how to date the rocks so that we knew which ones were old and which ones were young. But how do we know how to date the rocks? Well, you date the rocks by the fossils. That's how you date the rocks. And you begin to see, I hope, that we're involved in a vast circle of reasoning here. Each one is the evidence of the other. Each one is the proof of the other. Let me quote, for example, and this kind of illustrates it. There's a circle of reasoning. The proof of evolution is based on the assumption of evolution, actually. In the World Book Encyclopedia, which I guess everybody knows encyclopedias are infallible. It's bound to be right. Uh, the, in, in one volume of this book, volume 15, it says, paleontology, the study of fossils, is important in the study of geology because the age of the rocks may be determined by the fossils that are found in them. Get the age in the rocks of, the, of the rocks by the fossils. Then in volume seven of the same encyclopedia, it says scientists determine when fossils are formed by finding out the age of the rocks in which they lie. So you date the fossil by the rocks and the rocks by the fossils. Both are based on evolution. So what we really conclude then is that there is no real way to date these rocks. We can't discriminate which one is old and which one is young. In fact, they all could be the same age. In fact, the evidence, I think, for that is overwhelming. Now, that means, of course, if we're going to try to date them at the same time, instead of over vast ages of different time, then we have to give up the idea that they were formed slowly and gradually as formations take place today, slow erosion of gullies and slow deposition of sediments on floodplains, things like that. No, we can't use these slow processes to, to determine how the rocks were formed. Rather, we have to think in terms of cataclysmic processes, great rapid movement of sediments and great erosion taking place quickly. Now, there's a lot of evidence of that. For example, the very existence of the fossils in the rock speaks of vast 
intense process is taking place. After all, remember now, these fossils are used to date the rocks, but how do fossils get there in the first place? They're dead things, they're dead animals, dead plants, but uh, you can't have just dead plants, you've got to, or dead animals, you've got to have buried animals and plants. Animals, you've got to have buried animals and plants. They've got to be buried by sediments, and furthermore, buried quickly before erosion and air and bacteria can cause decay. Got to be buried quickly and compacted quickly, or they would never be preserved as fossils at all. And yet, we have all through the record of the rocks in all the geological ages, great beds of fossils. That's how the rocks are identified. For example, here's one in California. These are in the so-called Miocene Shale, supposedly about 20 million years old, up uh, near Lompoc. And there they estimate that in four square miles of that shale formation, they have one billion fossil herring fish. Now, how do you get a billion fossil fish buried in a rock? Not by any slow process of uniform sedimentation at all. Rather, some great upwelling of sediments from the bottom of the ocean or something had to just overwhelm them before they could get away. That's what no doubt happened. Even one fish is not going to be fossilized unless he's buried suddenly. You know, when a fish dies, it doesn't settle down to the bottom of the ocean or the bottom of the lake and wait for a hundred years for silt to settle on top and make a fossil. Rather, it washes up on the surface, up on the seashore, scavengers come along or something, and pretty soon it's gone. So to get fossil fish, you've got to have catastrophic burial and compaction quickly or they wouldn't be preserved at all. But not only do we have these billion fossil herring out in California, great numbers of fossil catfish and other types of fish out in Wyoming, in the Green River Shales, and there are great beds of fish up in New York and Scotland, and everywhere you find great beds of fossil fish. And furthermore, find other kinds of fossils. Here, for example, is a quarry in Nebraska. And here in this particular quarry, not just fish, but fishes and mammals and reptiles, all kinds of fossils are found all jammed together in these beds there in uh, Agate Springs Quarry in Nebraska. And then you think of the millions of fossil elephants that were preserved in the permafrost soils up in Alaska and Siberia, and other kind of animals up there too. And great beds of hippopotamus fossils in Sicily. And great dinosaur fossils just about all over the world. You find great beds of dinosaurs in New Mexico and Wyoming and Alberta and Spitsbergen near the North Pole, even Antarctica near the South Pole and Central Asia. Just about anywhere in the world you can find great beds of dinosaur fossils. Now these animals were not buried and fossilized by any slow process. They had to be buried quickly or they wouldn't be preserved. And as a matter of fact, I think you can show that in every kind of geological formation. Here, for example, is a canyon section, not too far from here, as a matter of fact. And you can tell by looking at that, if that was formed by the usual process that evolutionists talk about, it would take a long time to form that canyon by the river gradually eroding it down at the bottom. And as a matter of fact, it would take a long time for all the sediments with their layers there to be deposited too. You'd think, but no, as a matter of fact, all of those sedimentary layers, fine stratified sediments were formed in essentially one day, and the canyon was eroded in, in essentially one day. That's at Mount St. Helens up in Washington. Now, Dr. Steve Austin has done, of our staff has done quite a bit of work up there and has a beautiful video and lecture on that. Maybe you'll have an opportunity to see that sometime. But this does indicate that you can have very rapid formation of those geological phenomena which normally have been interpreted as requiring long ages of time. Here's another one. This you maybe have seen at uh, Carlsbad Cavern if you've been there. This was published in National Geographic on the cover, I think, several years ago. And they tell you about how these stalagmites are formed by the dripping of water from the roof. And then it uh, evaporates and leaves this calcium carbonate deposit there. And it says it takes a long, long time to build up a great stalagmite like that. But then you look at that fossil in the stalagmite and you see what that is. That's a fossil bat. Can't you just imagine that fossil bat perching there for a million years while the stuff rips around and makes a fossil out of him? Obviously, that was formed quickly. And here's another one. These are what are known as polystrate fossils. That is, they go through many different strata, different geological ages. This, these are fossil tree trunks. And yet the, fossil, the sediments through which they are uh, extending represent long periods of deposition by the normal way of calculating it. And you find these in coal seams where there are many different coal seams with the same polystrate fossil going through many of them. That indicates that the coal beds and the other sediments that are formed around these were formed rapidly or the tree trunks wouldn't have been preserved and fossilized at all. And you begin to see that you can find, and I think we took, if we had the time, we could show that every type of geological formation
every type of structure, every type of system can only be explained in terms of rapid formation in the geological column. But it's not just we creationists who think that. Let me read a statement from Dr. Derek Ager. Dr. Ager was president of the British Geological Association. He's not a creationist. He's an evolutionist, probably an atheist, all that you can gather from his writings anyway. But he does in his book, The Nature of the Stratigraphic Record, go through what I just said, all the different types of geological systems show that all of them were formed by catastrophes. He says, for example, the hurricane, the flood, the tsunami may do more in an hour or a day than the ordinary processes of nature can achieve in a thousand years. That sounds a little like the Bible, doesn't it? One day is with a catastrophe as a thousand years. Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. One day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. And that's exactly what in the context the, the apostle is saying. He says, God can do in one day what you would think would take a thousand years. And that's what Dr. Ager is saying that these great catastrophes can accomplish as much geological work in one day as normally would take in our present rate of phenomena a thousand years to accomplish. And he goes on to say the very last sentence of his book, he says this, in other words, the history of any one part of the earth, like the life of a soldier, consists of long periods of boredom and short periods of terror. Everything you see in the geological record is terror, catastrophe, destruction, sudden calamity. Now, he doesn't think they were all a biblical flood. He doesn't believe in that. He doesn't think they were the same catastrophe. He thinks there were these different floods and tsunamis and earthquakes and so on, each one separated from the next one by maybe a million years. But, of course, we would say, remember that science is what you see, and if all we see in the geological record is catastrophe, on what basis do you say there are millions of years in there that we don't see? No evidence for those. The only evidence for those is that we must have that to make evolution look feasible. But all, what we, all that we actually see in the geological record can be explained much better in terms of intense catastrophic processes than in terms of slow, uniform evolutionary processes. Now, the only question then that still would remain would be, well, is he right in thinking these are all different catastrophes or could they all really be the same one? I think the evidence is overwhelming that they're all the same. After all, remember, that in all the so-called geological ages, we have the same types of rocks, we have the same types of minerals and metals and contents, structures, everything is the same in all the geological ages. There's no way that you can distinguish one age from another except by evolution and the identification of the fossils in the different ages. And you do that on the basis of evolution by the circular reasoning that we mentioned. So really the obvious fact is that since all of these are essentially look the same, therefore they probably all were formed at essentially the same time. But I think if you look again at the concept of unconformities, which we mentioned were time gaps, you'll see that that's really necessarily true. Now this may not be quite obvious, but if you think about it a minute, I think you'll see the reasoning here. Here we have two sections, one and two, and two formations, A and B. And you notice that uh, the two sections are different in that although they're the same formations, at one section there's an unconformity, and another section there isn't. The idea would be that originally this was, these sediments were all laid down in the bottom formation, horizontal, which is way strata are laid down when the water stops and the sediment drops out. Then they harden into rock over a period of time. But then somewhere along the way there was a geological uplift that took place at, the, uh, at section one. And so in the process of uplift there, the strata were tilted until they got up above the water surface, so deposition stopped and erosion began over there at section one, but in section two, the uplift didn't take place. So it stayed the same and deposition continued there and there was no unconformity there. There were still conformities at that point. And the idea here is that even though there may be an unconformity at one section between two formations, the same two formations somewhere else will be perfectly conformable and continuous. The deposition process never stopped. Now you get the point, I presume, that since the unconformity represents a time lapse, and just the unconformity itself doesn't tell how long that time might have been because there's nothing there to measure. It's just the absence of anything. So it might have been a long time or a short time, we don't know. But in section where there is no unconformity between the same formations, there was no time lapse. That means that the time gap did not go continuously through the whole formation. As a matter of fact, that's true everywhere around the world. Let me read a statement from Dr. Amos Salvador and this man is an authority because he is the chairman of the International Subcommission on Stratigraphic Classification of the Geological Society of America. So we ought to know about, he ought to know about this if anybody does.
and the title of his article is Unconformity Bounded Stratigraphic Units. Now remember that unconformities do represent gaps in time. And what he says is this, unconformity bounded units became very popular at the time tectonic episodes, tectonic episodes, that means mountain building periods, orogenies. And originally it was thought by the early geologists that at the end of the Cambrian period there was a great mountain building revolution and there was a great unconformity that separated that period from the next one which was the Ordovician period. And at the end of each of the great periods there was a great mountain building period that left a great worldwide unconformity indicating when that age stopped and the next one began. So he says unconformity bounded units became very popular when tectonic episodes were considered essentially synchronous worldwide. But they did lose favor among geologists when synchroneity was found not to hold true. Now what that is saying is that there is no worldwide unconformity. That means there is no worldwide time gap. Now get the significance of this. If there is no worldwide time gap in the geological column, if the whole deposition process throughout the column is continuous, there may be a deposition stop one place, but it'll continue somewhere else. That means we can start anywhere at the bottom of the geological column and begin to work our way to the top. And as you go up from the bottom, the crystalline basement rocks at the bottom, begin to go up, you'll go through the sedimentary deposits until you come to an unconformity. But that unconformity is not worldwide, so you can move around someplace else till you get to a place like this where there is no unconformity but to the next formation, then go up to that one, and so on. You may have to zigzag around a bit to get to the top, but you can do that all the way from the bottom up to the top without ever crossing one of these unconformities or time gaps. And now, since even men like Dr. Ager and many other modern geologists who are saying that every geological formation was formed by some sort of rapid catastrophe, since that's true of every formation, and since you could go from one formation to the next without ever crossing a time gap, that means along that trace that you make, the deposition process was continuous and every unit of it was rapid. And therefore, since you can do that anywhere in the geological column, it seems to me like you come to this conclusion that although these may not all be the same catastrophe, nevertheless they're all interconnected and continuous, comprising finding a great complex of catastrophes which are equivalent to a worldwide uh, cataclysmic flood which, in which the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Peter says, don't be ignorant of this one thing. God can do in one day what would normally take a thousand years. And then he would say he hasn't forgotten his promise. Men will say, where's the promise of his coming? But he hasn't forgotten that promise. He's uh, keeping it. And the day of the Lord is going to come in which the world is going to be destroyed by fire just as it was in the old days of Noah by, by water. In the meantime, we have to be faithful. We have to count that the long-suffering of the Lord is salvation, and He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance and do all that we can to bring people to change their minds, which is what repent means, and bring them in line with the mind of Christ and the revelation of the Word of God. Okay, thank you very much. In the face of all this evidence, the words of Second Peter chapter 3 come ringing clear. One must be willingly ignorant to ignore all the evidence for the global flood. Questions like where did the water come from, how did the animals fit on the ark were covered in the program, but they are covered in much more depth in the book The Genesis Flood, which Dr. Morris co-authored. These and other creation materials, including other programs in this Back to Genesis series, have been mightily used by God to answer questions, both biblical and scientific, to convince skeptics of the truth of creation, to train up children in the way they should go, to establish the importance of creation to the Christian faith. They can be ordered.